What happens to your penis if you don't have sex? If you don't have sex for a long time, if you have sex infrequently, what can happen to your penis? Guys, I'm Dr. Jen Caudill, practicing family physician, on-air health expert, and video creator. That is the topic of today. Uh, I'm going to give you four main things that I want to talk about today that um, changes that you can see in your penis um, if you don't have sex. Let's just jump right in. Let's start with the first one, okay? Uh, the first one is that infrequent sex can actually cause the tissue uh, on your penis, around your penis, to become less elastic, okay? And it can also shrink. Now, this can actually lead to your penis being one to two centimeters shorter. So that is something that can actually happen with infre infrequent sex, um, not having sex. Your penis can kind of shrink due to decreased elasticity of the tissue around on the penis uh, and also sort of shrinkage. So keep this in mind. Now, um, I also want to mention I've done some videos on um, uh, what the average penis size is. By the way, you probably will be surprised. I'll make sure I link that video in the comments, in the description of this video, and I'll also sort of link it as well and the cards, etc. You can DM me if you don't see it. Um, but we're also going to talk about a few other things I think is important. I should also say, the reason why I'm doing this video is, by the way, as a family doctor, I talk about all sorts of health, you know, everything, right? Blood pressure, cholesterol, diabetes, et cetera, men's health, women's health. I did a video on what can happen or what happens to your vagina if you don't have sex. And uh, a lot of people watch that video asking, well, what happens to the penis if you don't have sex? So that is where this video is coming from. And I think it was an excellent question. Okay. So the first thing is that yes, your penis can kind of shrink. Um, it can become less elastic. It can, um, it can kind of have some shrinkage. Okay. If sex is infrequent, uh, if you don't have sex, all right, moving on to the next thing. Uh, and I think this is really important. You know, this is not just a vanity thing. And I want to be very clear when I talk about sexual health, and this is something we should all feel this is about our overall health. Sexual health is part of overall health. So in talking about what happens to your penis, we're essentially also indirectly or directly talking about what happens to your health. That's one of the reasons, biggest reasons why this is so important. Okay, number two, um, what else happens if you don't have sex? Uh, what happens to your penis? Well, infrequent sex may actually lead to erectile dysfunction. That's right. Um, infrequent sex, not having sex uh, can in, in, in a... In a uh, in a person who has a penis could actually lead to a higher risk of erectile dysfunction later on in life. Now, there's a number of reasons why this potentially may be the case. Um, and I also want to say, you know, this, this is not one size fits all, okay? But this is according to some of the best evidence we have at this time. These are some general principles that we do think apply to many people who have penises, okay? Um, but yes, it is often thought that infrequent sex, sex in some people may may lead to um, a higher risk of erectile dysfunction later on in life, okay? Um, moving on, number three. So, um, and, and before I tell you what number three is, let me explain just very briefly when we talk about erections, okay? Erections are very important because what happens when someone gets an erection is that there is blood flow that goes into the penis. That is one of the main things that causes it to be erect. It is blood flow. Now, remember, blood flow is really important to our whole body for so many different reasons. Blood carries oxygen, all sorts of, it does a lot of things. So blood flow in general, for most parts of our body and most things, is actually a good thing. It is for a penis as well, because an erection means there is blood flow. So sex, uh, rather, or an erection, rather, um, means there's an increased blood flow to the penis, which... Uh, tends to lead to stronger and longer erections um, and sort of really contributes to healthy, a healthy penis, you know, penis health in general. Meaning uh, when you have erections, you're really contributing to your overall penis health. Let me put it that way. Hopefully that, that makes sense. You're contributing to your overall penis health because erections means that there is blood flow going into the penis and that is good for your overall penis health. Um, stronger, longer erections, et cetera, potentially. If you're not having erections, if you're uh, uh, not having erections frequently, et cetera, you may be at a disadvantage. You may not have that advantage that some other people may have if they are having uh, you know, more frequent erections. Okay. So keep that in mind that erection is about blood flow and blood flow, um, to the penis. That's a good thing. Okay. 
Um, moving on, and by the way, I should also say too, I have some videos on um, when it co comes to sexual health, um, it's not just about what happens to the penis if you don't have sex um, or don't have sex for a long time. I do have videos also on what happens to your penis as you age, because there are changes that naturally occur, just um, like with a, a vagina, there are changes that occur. Um, but there are also things that we should understand about erectile dysfunction. I have videos on erectile dysfunction, low testosterone, the causes of ED or erectile dysfunction. Just make sure you check those out because there are other videos that may answer some other questions that may come up for you during this video. Okay, the last thing I wanna talk about, the fourth and final thing is, uh, uh, regarding ejaculation, okay? So I think this is so interesting, but there have been some studies that actually show that men who ejaculate more uh, may actually have a lower risk of prostate cancer. That sounds like good news to me, and I have a feeling it probably sounds like good news to a lot of people. You know, it's it's, and I think it's also hopefully reassuring to you as you're watching this video that, you know, this idea of erections, it's actually a physiological function that is healthy for our body. Ejaculation, actually, we think of as sort of a, a healthy process, okay, for our body. So this sort of plays into that and plays a role in that, that some of these studies, again, have shown that, you know, men who, who ejaculate more uh, may have a lower risk of prostate cancer, okay? Um, now, there are uh, some some studies that sort of refute this. There, you know, this, this is up for a little bit of debate, depending on, you know, which experts you talk to. Some may have a different spin, but a higher, um, higher rate of ejaculations has been a associated with a lower risk of prostate cancer. And, you know, if you're not ejaculating, you may not have this potential benefit, okay? Um, and that, that's something really important to keep in mind. The point here is that not only should we be taking care of our minds and our heart and our kidneys and our liver and our pancreas and, and our, you know, our extremities and all sorts of stuff, our skin, but you know, our sexual organs are not just for sex, they also have a place and a role in our overall health. Um, when it comes to the penis, erections are healthy. It means blood flow. Ejaculation can be very healthy and so much more. And by the way, these four things that I mentioned are just four things that can happen if you don't uh, have sex, things that can happen to the penis if you don't have sex, potentially, right? There are so many other things. You think about the psychological aspect. Remember that sexual, uh, sexuality, sexual intercourse, um, being sexually involved with someone, there is intimacy in that. There is a lot that goes on and in with that that gives us benefit, okay, that I'm not mentioning, that you may not get if you're not um, intimate with someone or sexually involved, okay? So keep that in mind. This is just a beginning. Um, but just remember, okay, um, that, you know, sexual health is very, very important. As always, I am an advocate of safe, safe sex, appropriate sex, consensual sex, and all of the above. What I would say is if you have any questions about any of this, um, ask your doctor. Use this video as a starting point to say, Hey doc, I want to talk to you about X, Y, or Z, A, B, C. Also take a look at some other, my, uh, my other videos about what happens to your penis as you age, um, injuries that can happen during sex, uh, low testosterone, erectile dysfunction, and things like that. Um, but, um, you know, a healthy, uh, sex life can be very, very important for our overall health. Um, I hope this was helpful. Please let me know. Please write in the comments. Let me know your thoughts. Share this video with anyone you think could benefit from it. I'm Dr. Jen Caudill, practicing family physician, on-air health expert and video creator. I do daily videos and all sorts of stuff. Please like and follow my page on Facebook, on YouTube. Please subscribe to my channel. Click the little bell for updates. Also, check out my website, drjencaudill.com. I have a free health newsletter that goes out. Um, subscribe. Would love to. Um, I would love to keep in touch. Leave me a comment. Let me know what you think. All right, guys. Bye. Ask yourself the question. Is the government or the global elite secretly behind NoFap? Is NoFap, in fact, a tool to reduce men's fertility and sex drive? Are governments using social media to trick, brainwash, and manipulate young men into a sex-negative lifestyle, which lowers men's desire for sex and relationships? Can governments use social media to spread anti-sex propaganda to reduce the sexuality of young men and women, and thus affect childbearing and countries. Demographics is no FAP, in fact, a weapon of human depopulation.
And speaking of families, Le Croix has an article today about climate change and the role of families, the Ex role that they play in that. Exactly. Uh, should we limit the world's population to save the planet? That's the headline this morning in La Croix. Uh, they, uh, they are talking about how Emmanuel Macron is going to the climate summit uh, today, and he'll be joined by other state heads of state as well as thousands of activists. Now, the paper goes into how earlier this week, 15,000 scientists signed a petition calling for measures to help limit the world's population by promoting family planning and educating people, especially young girls. Now, Lacroix says, uh, now it's important to note that Lacroix is actually a uh, Christian paper. So the paper says it's a very sensitive subject and they call for, quote, responsible procreation. Um, but Lacroix says that certain measures such as abortion and certain forms of birth control are not acceptable. But they also took, talk to another activist who has very different view on that. A bunch of different studies. And then through synthesizing all of these studies, you get this graph, which we are putting on the screen here, and which, Simone, you are looking at right now, I assume. Yes, sir. Okay. So what was your read of what's happening in the graph? Because I remember it was wrong, and I want to see how you got <laughs> this wrong read. Because it was wrong. What I saw from this was that we we are seeing the same thing that we have always been seeing, which is that women in their 20s have been delaying fertility more and more and more. Oh, no, I see. Yeah, I see where I was misreading it, because I thought yeah. in the past women in their 30s were making up for it. No, no. And they What's aren't. What's fascinating about this graph is it divides fertility of women in the United States into four groups okay? age, brackets, age brackets age brackets yes 20 to 24 25 to 29 30 to 34 and 35 to 39. Mm -hmm. what is fascinating is that only one of these groups is declining in fertility if you yeah. were looking only at the 30 to 35 women their fertility has actually gone up a bit over time same with 35 to 39. same with the 35 big, to 39. Anyone over 30 is having more well, a higher now, fertility rate on average now 25 to 29 has gone down marginally but cool. only marginally it could yeah. be a statistical error all of the fertility collapse in our country is coming from women under 24 years of age the, the lion's share at least the 20 to 20 25 no. to 29 range went down from around 2.1 to 2 which is non-trivial like to just under 2 but okay. what we see from 20 to 24 is it going from just under 2.1 to 1.8, a pretty big drop. I'd argue it is trivial. It isn't non-trivial. It, it, it is trivial. In the world of fertility collapse, a 0.1 decline in a period of like 10 years is basically irrelevant. The vast majority of the decline is, is, is coming from this incredibly young group. Yeah, they went from just below 2.1 to 1.8. They're certainly, yeah, the youngest, the youngest 20-somethings that used to be having kids are taking the lion's share of this. Well, this is fascinating. And there's another thing you may not have noticed here. If you add up these groups, they then don't match to the overall fertility decline. There is additional fertility decline that is not being captured in these statistics. Do you see that? Mm. Okay. Do you see the dotted line? Yeah. Okay, that's the total TFR, right? Yeah, yeah, yes. The total TFR shouldn't be able to go below the lowest of the indicator groups. Yeah, I don't get that. <laughs> okay. So there's two things that could be causing that. It could be women under 20 have maybe just completely disappeared as a fertility group, mm. which we actually know is true. Teenage mm. pregnancies are way down. Yeah. So teenage pregnancies. It could also be, as we know, people like to fiddle with fertility data to make it not look as extreme as it is. Right. Um, but all of the trends here are basically the same. So I don't think we need to read too much into this. The core answer here is that the thing that is causing fertility collapse in our country is women under the age of 24 not having kids. The Telegraph UK recently published an article called Why the World Stopped Having Sex. So this is not just a Gen Z problem. This is a Western world problem that fewer and fewer people are engaging in intimate encounters. Okay, so they have this. Is it AIDS? 
Okay. This article is uh, riddled with uh, a lot of uh, data. So they're saying that France is one of the main countries that is in a sex recession. That's what the Telegraph calls it, just to give you some of these stats. According to a recent poll by the French Institute of Public Opinion, 24% of French adults between the ages 18 and 69, I have no idea why they chose that as the age for this poll, 24% of French adults between the ages 18 and 69 said they had no sex over the past 12 months. That is is way up from 9% in 2006, okay? Also, the proportion of those aged 18 to 24 who had never had sex was at 28% up from 5% in 2006. And by the way, lest I be like Claudine Gay, that is a direct quote from the Telegraph UK, direct quote, direct quote. Ding, Julie Hartman. Not gay. Mm -hmm. Overall, 43% of the 1,911 respondents said they had sex at least once a week, compared with 58% in 2009. So TLDR, fewer people are having sex and fewer people are having sex frequently. Quote, overall, the proportion of French people who've had sexual intercourse in the past year, 76% on average, is at its lowest in 50 years. And they have a chart. Finally, a topic I can weigh in on. I am an expert in not having sex. These are the moments where I wonder why. But no, this is this is not just apparently not happening in France. This is also not happening in other parts of the Western world. According to the Journal of Sex Research, again, quoting from The Telegraph, uh, they took data on 180,000 teens in 33 mostly Western countries, including England, Wales, and Scotland, over 10 years. And they found that in 25 countries, the number of 15-year-olds who reported that they've had sex has significantly decreased and increased in none. By the way, I think that's great. I mean, I think 15 is too young. So I think that's a positive trend If, if, because, I mean, that age... That's, I wouldn't exactly cite that as a st- statistic to say that there's an overall problem. I, I like that. Uh, the, the strict burgeoning parent in me one day <laughs> approves of that, uh, uh, that piece of data. But basically overall, let's scrap the, the data about the 15-year-olds. There is a trend among uh, 18 and older in America, in the United Kingdom, in a lot of countries in the Western world that they are having less sex compared to previous generations. And also, interestingly, this is this is also the case in several countries outside of Europe slash the Western world. Quoting from the article, outside of Europe, the most sex starved of all appeared to be the Japanese. 68% of marriages in the country are completely sexless. And the Telegraph said, you know, this may be part of a problem that they're having with the falling birth rate. Huge falling birth rate in in Japan, also a similar problem in China. But in China, it's because of the the one child policy. But there is also a culture of restraint in those countries, especially in Japan. When you go to Japan, uh, I've never been, but a lot of my friends and family have been, and all of them say the same thing, that when you go, it's an incredibly clean, organized country. Like on the streets, people like walk it either on the right side or on the left side there's very little trash if at all but they said that although it's very organized you don't see like a lot of people having fun you don't see a father out playing throwing a football with his kid you don't see people holding hands or laughing so there is kind of a culture there of restraint there's not a you know, the japanese football league i've never heard of it i've never been to japan i stand out years ago i released this video titled um a global warming human virus and it was flagged by youtube and i uh, ended up deleting it from my channel but now i'm gonna, now I'm gonna re-release it with this uh new new opening and i'm gonna uh start this video by showing you alexandria acasio cortez the master puppet behind the green new deal who now says that it's uh, that it's immoral to have children, and that uh, she says it's legitimate to ask you to stop having children in order to save the the planet from climate change. And so it's basically like there's scientific consensus that the lives of children are going to be very difficult, and it does lead, I think, young people to have a legitimate question. You know, should is it okay to still have children? And I mean, not just financially, because 
people are graduating with twenty, thirty, a hundred thousand dollars worth of student loan debt, and so they can't even afford to have kids in a house. But also just this basic moral question: like, what do we do? And and even if you don't have kids. There are still children here in the world, and we have a moral obligation to them and uh, to leave a better world for them. And this idea that if we just, you know, I've been working on this for X amount of years, um, it's like not good enough. Like we need a universal sense of urgency, and people are frankly going to kill us. A lack of urgency is going to kill us. It doesn't matter if you agree that climate change. Is an important issue. It, at, at this point, it doesn't matter if you if you believe climate change is a problem. That's not even the issue. So once again, now in, in real life, we're seeing the link between uh, the the fallacy of overpopulation and the link between the depopulation agenda and global warming, which I pointed out a few years ago in the movie The Kingsman. And uh, I'm going to let you watch. This video from a few years ago, um, it's titled The Global Warming Human Virus and Fair Use, Bitches. So hey guys, Jeff here again. And today I want to talk about the New World Order's global warming and depopulation agenda and how the two are connected, okay? Because I've been seeing a pattern forming in the movies for quite some time now and in the news. So let's begin by watching this first scene, this famous scene from The Matrix, which came out in 1999. <laughs> I'd like to share a revelation that I've had during my time here. It came to me when I tried to classify your species. I realized that you're not actually mammals. Every mammal on this planet instinctively develops a natural equilibrium with the surrounding environment, but you humans do not. You move to an area and you multiply and multiply until every natural resource is consumed. And the only way you can survive is to spread to another area. There is another organism on this planet that follows the same pattern. Do you know what it is? A virus. Human beings are a disease, a cancer of this planet. You are a plague, and we are the cure. So I was 10 years old when this movie came out. This was the first time I was ever introduced to the idea that the human race is a virus. And I have to admit that the idea of humanity being a virus kind of stuck with me. It didn't sit right with me, and I never forgot that. That's a famous uh, scene from that movie, The Matrix. And then last week, I saw this movie, The Kingsman, for the first time, and there was a similar theme to it. So let's watch a few scenes from this movie, The Kingsman. And this movie was filled with all sorts of Illuminati symbolism. You know, you got uh, global warming, depopulation, the mark of the beast, you know, the sellout elite or the Illuminati. This movie had everything. I definitely recommend watching the movie, The Kingsman. But let's watch a few scenes from this movie. Nobody told me to try and save the planet. I wanted to. Climate change research, lobbying, years of study, billions of dollars, and you know why I quit? Because the last time I checked, the planet was still fucked. So here you got the philanthropic billionaire played by Samuel L. Jackson. He says he wants to save the planet from global warming, but that it's too late, that the planet is already fucked. Right, so this is a common theme, like it's too late. Climate change is a threat which affects us all, Mr. Valentine. And you're one of the few powerful men who seems to share my concerns. Oh, I shut things down because I wasn't getting anywhere. Every bit of research kept pointing to the same thing. The carbon emissions are a red herring, and we're past the point of no return, no matter what remedial actions we take. <laughs> oh, you know your shit. So in that scene, they actually snuck a little truth in. The guy says that carbon emissions are a red herring, which is which kind of means like it's a diversion, it's a distraction, it's not true. They're blaming global warming on carbon emissions from the burning of fossil fuels from human beings. But if the Earth is actually warming, it's not from the CO2 emissions. OK, 
Okay, that's the lie. They're doing something else to heat up the planet. Something else is happening. It has nothing to do with you burning gasoline in your car or spraying your aerosol cans. Okay, They want to make it seem like you are responsible for the environment because this is just another way to control you. They want to sell you the, the very air you breathe. As Professor Arnold always said, humankind is the only virus cursed to live with the horrifying knowledge of its host's fragile mortality. So again, just like in the movie The Matrix, the human race is being compared to a virus and the Earth being the host. But in this next scene, this is where they tie it all together and this is where it all starts to make sense. Once he explained, I understood. When you get a virus, you get a fever. That's the human body raving at core temperature to kill the virus. Planet Earth works the same way. Global warming is the fever. Mankind is the virus. We're making our planet thick. A coal is our only hope. If we don't reduce our population ourselves, there's only one of two ways this can go. The host kills the virus, or the virus kills the host. Either way, the result is the same. The virus dies. So Valentine's going to take care of the population problem himself. Well, if we don't do something, nature will. Sometimes a culling is the only way to ensure that the species survives. So humans are the virus, the earth is the host, and global warming is the fever. That's the host way of fighting off the virus. So this is how the climate change, the global warming and depopulation agendas come together. They're trying to tell you that the earth is warming to fight off overpopulation. And this is because the philanthropic billionaires of this world, they really do want to depopulate the earth. Okay, we can go to the Georgia Guidestones. I was there this summer. I took this photograph. Here's a photo of my dog in front of the, uh, the monument in Elberton, Georgia. Here's another photo of him in front of the monument, in front of the English side. This is a photo of Cash after he peed on the Georgia Guidestones, so that's good boy Cash, way to go. And this is on the ground right next to the Georgia Guidestones. It says, erected March 22nd, 1980. That's 322-1980. If you don't know, 322 that's the number of Yale Skull and Bones. So I don't think this date is a random date. 322 is a very occult number. And it says, let these be guidestones to an age of reason. And on these guidestones are commandments. And the very first Georgia Guidestone commandment says, maintain humanity under 500 million in perpetual balance with nature. Okay, so the planet has about 7 billion people on it right now, and they want to maintain humanity at under 500 million, which means 6.5 to 7 billion people are going to have to die, okay, to keep humanity in perpetual balance with nature, okay, and these guidestones were erected in Elberton, Georgia, which is the granite capital of the world, and it's not far from where Ted Turner is from. And some people have speculated that these guidestones were paid for by Ted Turner. And it really wouldn't surprise me if you've heard some of Ted Turner's comments. Not doing it will be catastrophic. We'll have eight degrees, we'll be eight degrees hotter in 10, not 10, but in 30 or 40 years. And basically none of the crops will grow. Most of the people will have died and the rest of us will be cannibals. Civilization will have broken down. What The few people who are left will be living in a, in, in a failed state like Somalia or Sudan, and, and living conditions will be intolerable. The droughts will be so bad, there'll be no more corn growing. It, it will, the, the not doing it is suicide, just like dropping bombs on each other, nuclear weapons is suicide. So we've got to stop doing the two suicidal things, which are nuclear hanging on to our and, nuclear and, weapons. And global and, and then after that, we've got to, we've got to, stabilize the population. When I was born, no, there was So what's wrong with the population? I mean... With too many people. That's what. That's why we have global warming. We have global warming because too many people are using too much stuff. But if there were less people, they'd be using less but stuff. It, so this guy is all for depopulation. He thinks that global warming is directly connected to overpopulation and that we need to reduce the population for the, for the greater good. Here's another clip of him being confronted out in public about the depopulation agenda. But isn't it true that 
stopping the rise in population would be one of the biggest levers in driving the rise in greenhouse gases. Is that? Well, I, I mean, we all know we expect 9 billion, right, by, by 2050. Um, so, yes, obviously less people would exert less um, pressure on the natural resources, and, um, and, and that's it's So is 9 math. billion a foregone conclusion that's like baked in, done, not going to, no way to change that? Well, there again, there's pressure in the system um, to go toward that. We, we can definitely change those, right? We can definitely change those numbers, um, and we really should make every effort to change the numbers because we are already today, already exceeding the planetary car carrying capacity today to say nothing of adding more population that is going to really overextend our capacity. So yes, we should do everything possible, but we cannot call, fall into the very simplistic opinion of saying just by curtailing population, then we've solved the problem. It is not an either or, it is an and also. This exhibit in our resource room features our beloved curator, Dr. Reiner Engel, who curated the museum for almost 20 years. Uh, his grandson even helped us build this exhibit. Now, one of his favorite artifacts, he even demonstrated it for CNN, is the anti-masturbation ring. Now, in the 1800s, there was a huge outcry against masturbation, and it really started, let's say, in Europe. But it soon came over to America, and we even have a pamphlet that was discovered in a time capsule. It was written by the American Medical Institute, which was founded in 1857, and the entire pamphlet is about the dangers of masturbation, all the horrible things that will happen to you, like, you've heard these jokes, going blind, uh, losing your mind, being weak, well, people didn't really understand the effects of ejaculation at that time. So instruments like this were developed, this spermatorrhea ring it was called. And the idea behind it was you put it on your little boy's penis before he went to sleep at night. And if he had a nocturnal erection, sooner or later, the sides of the penis would be pressed against these sharp spikes and that would be the end of the erection. Now, to us, this seems incredibly cruel, but this was so commonly thought of that it's even shown in a Sears catalog from 1903. They sold the spermatorrhea ring for a quarter. <laughs> 